For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now, one of the problems with Christmas um, is that it is so easy to get bored. and bored of Turkey. Um, I remember weeks of wading through the leftovers from the 25 pound birds that my dad used to bring home. Um, bored of fruitcake. And if you're new to this country, you might find it extraordinary how many ways we find it to use dried fruit at this time of year. Most importantly, bored of Christmas itself. I was chatting to Simpo, our music director, who was telling me that he has played at 24 carol services this December. If that is representative, then you're looking at 672 carol services since he first joined the staff, which is very nearly the same number as test wickets that Jimmy Anderson has. Um, two of the all-time greats, I think. Uh, I don't know how many times I have heard John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, or Luke chapter 2 being read in a December carol service. I don't know how many sermons I have heard on the meaning of Jesus' names in Matthew chapter 1. I've sung the same seven or eight songs, scores, hundreds of times over the years. And of course, it's not just the religious professionals or the musicians or even Christians. Uh, in a country like this, everyone thinks that they know the Christmas story. Even in my children's thoroughly secular primary school, they have a nativity play for the reception age children every year. And sure, there is a little bit of confusion about exactly how many lobsters were present at the birth of the Lord Jesus. And sure, the donkey probably does feature a bit more prominently in the Christmas story than he ought to. But on the whole, we think we know. I wonder how many guests do you think have come to our guest services over the last few weeks? I wonder how many of those people do you think came because they wanted to find out the facts about Christmas? I'd be very surprised if you could count them on more than one hand. The problem with Christmas is that we get bored. It goes deeper than Christmas, doesn't it? Um, it is possible that you might be bored of Christianity itself. Well, if not exactly bored, at least you've heard it all before. It no longer holds any surprises for you. And the problem with thinking that you have heard it all before um, is that it makes us susceptible to thinking that something better might have come along. Whether it is the classic temptations, the love of money, sexual immorality, power, or the classic fears, persecution, isolation, death. Bored Christians 
are sitting ducks. Uh, one of the ironies about Christmas time is that we keep being told that we should be full of joyful wonder, and yet it is very often a time when people give in to temptation. Uh, the Christians to whom the passage that we just had read was first written were that kind of sitting duck. They thought that they had heard it all before, and so they were slowly drifting away from the gospel when the going got tough. And the author of this letter, Hebrews, his strategy is to surprise them. Um, not to surprise them by telling them exotic new things. No, to tell them old things from a new angle. And he goes through all of the key moments. Jesus' pre-existence, his birth, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his return. All the basics. And shows that they mean more. That they are bigger and deeper and more wonderful than they might have realized. And in Hebrews chapter two, he turns to Christmas, to the incarnation of the Son of God. Uh, did you notice as we were reading it just now that this is a Christmas passage? Uh, I mean, it tells it in an unfamiliar way. There's no Mary, no Magi, um, no manger. But it is Christmas, the moment when the exalted Son of God became for a little while lower than the angels. The moment when he chose to share in flesh and blood. The moment when he became like us in every way. And his aim is to put Christmas in its full context. Um, his aim is for us to understand that the manger is a moment with its roots in the dawn of time and its fruits in an eternal kingdom. And he wants us to see that it is just bigger than we might realize. Um, if you turn to um, this, this page of your service sheet, you'll see that it is completely useless to you this morning, but it does give you some white space. Um, and the first thing you might like to write on it is that at Christmas, Jesus came to take up humanity's fallen crown. And that's our first point this morning. At Christmas, Jesus came to take up humanity's fallen crown. I look down to verse five again. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we're speaking. It has been testified somewhere what is man that you're mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, straight away, you can see that this is an unfamiliar way to tackle Christmas. Goodness knows how many carol services I've been to over the years, but I don't think I have ever heard Psalm 8 read. It doesn't sound like a very Christmassy passage. It is not a Christmas passage. It is a creation passage. It is King David's great celebration of the extraordinary place of humanity in God's world. Look at verse six again. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man, humanity, that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. It is incredible how high a view of human beings the Bible takes. Um, as a society, as we've lost sight of our creator, we've also lost any notion of humanity's rightful place in this world. So we think that we're just a notch up from the beasts, that we ought to behave like beasts, and that we share the same fate as the beasts. Well, in Psalm 8, we're not a notch up from the animals. We are a notch down from the stars. Our place is as the rulers and guardians of all that God has made. And even more incredibly for King David, that was a mark of God's concern for us. Look at verse six. What is man that you, God, are mindful of him? The son of man, that you care for him. David looks up at the heavens. He looks at the stars and he wonders. He doesn't think, wow, they're so vast. We are so tiny and insignificant. No, he looks up and says, wow, they are so vast. How in a universe this vast? Can we have such a prominent place? It may be that you have lost a sense of your personal worth. And if you have done, Psalm 8 would not be a bad place to start. And just to remember the glory of what it is to be a human being, even a struggling human being. Psalm 8 is not a 
Christmas psalm, it is a creation psalm. Uh, So what does all this have to do with Christmas? Uh, Well, the problem is that the crown has slipped, Uh, not just slipped, it has fallen, verse 8. Now, in putting everything in subjection to humanity, God left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. It's a devastating few words, isn't it? In those few words, at present, we do not see all the chaos and disorder, death and despair, all that is out of joint and broken about this world, all of our failures, societal and individual, they're all covered. The crown has slipped. It has fallen in the dust. And that is where Christmas comes in. Verse 9. We do see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Verse 9 covers more than Christmas. It overspills. He starts with the son who was made for a little while lower than the angels, the son who was named Jesus. Those are Christmas facts. And then he overshoots into suffering and death and resurrection and ascension, glory and honor. But the incarnation is the focus. And if the question is, why did the exalted son of God become for a little while lower than the angels? The answer is so that he could pick up our crown. Verse eight, at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we do see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor. And we see him crowned, risen from the dead, enthroned. Somewhere in heaven, there is a man wearing the crown, our crown, a human being, back where humanity is meant to be no higher, not a notch below the stars, enthroned in majesty above them. It is extraordinary, isn't it? Extraordinary that in spite of everything, all the mess that we have made of this world, God can still be so mindfully, lavishly mindful of you that he sent his son to pick up our crown. David asked the question, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him? But the truth is that he only had half the data. He saw the vastness of the stars. He never dreamed that God was so committed to humanity, cared so much for us, that he would stoop down himself to take the crown. And of course, the point is that it, is, that it transforms our view of Christmas. In my heart, as you can tell, that it's getting close to Christmas because the digital radio in our kitchen gets changed from Premier Christian Praise to Heart Xmas. I won't tell you who's in charge of the controls. Um, And this year, as the Christmas songs of yesteryear sort of started rolling in, um, I thought I'd actually take the time to listen to the words. Um, And do you know what? They are, some of them are extraordinarily sentimental. I mean, incredibly gushy. And so here is Christopher singing about the spaceman who came traveling. La, 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 la. Peace and goodwill to all men and love for a child. Um, Or Johnny Mathis, a rosy hue settles all around. You've got to feel you're on solid ground. I should probably be giving a trigger warning for vomiting here, shouldn't I? For a spell or two, nothing seems forlorn. This comes to pass when a child is born. You get the sense from these guys that that they think that if you could only get into a time machine and go back 2,000 years, you would see a moment of transcendental cuteness, uh, the goat of beautifully choreographed baby photos. I think there really is a limit to how much wonder you can really drum up that way. The Andrex puppy is very cute. It doesn't really change anything, does it? Listen, the manger is much, much bigger than that. If you're bored of it, stop trying to wander at the cuteness and look again. See it in its full dress colors. It is the moment when the Son of God swept down below the angels, 
More than that, the moment that God showed himself so determined to remake the world that we had undone, that he became a man to do it. At Christmas, we're seeing the moment when Jesus stooped to take our fallen crown. But the good news is that he did it for us. Secondly, this morning, Christmas is the moment that Jesus came to claim his brothers. Jesus, the moment Jesus, that Jesus, Christmas is the moment that Jesus came to claim his brothers and his sisters. Verse 10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, that is God, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That's why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I'll sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children that God has given me. And there's lots that's complicated about those verses. And don't worry, I'm not going to try and explain it all. And the overall thrust is clear. The purpose of the incarnation was not to replace humanity. It was to save us. And verse 10 again, it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. And that word glory in that verse, it's not changed definition since the verse before. Um, in verse 9, he was talking about the glory and honor, humanity's rightful crown, our place in the world. But it turns out that God's purpose is not just to put one man on the throne, his son, the Lord Jesus. It is to bring many sons to glory. Just think of that. And that is why Jesus calls us brothers. Verse 11, that is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. They're extraordinary verses, aren't they? Why did the Son of God become a man? Well, imagine the words looking into this creation that he had made and seeing humanity ruined and ruinous, incompetent and misled, oppressed and cruel, and saying, they are my brothers. I'm going to make them my brothers. Uh, you may know the French carol um, that we sing as O oh, Holy Night. It's chiefly famous in my extended family for being covered by the 1990s boy band sensation, Hanson. Uh, what you may not know is that the lyrics are really quite a lot better in French um, than they are in English. I don't mean that they sound better in French. I mean, everything sounds better in French. Um, I mean that in the process of translation, almost all of the theology has been lost. And here's how the, verse, the second verse begins in the original. The Redeemer has broken every barrier. The earth is free and heaven is wide open. And then you get this lovely thought. He, that is the Lord Jesus, he saw a brother where there had only been a slave. He saw a brother where there had only been a slave. That's it, isn't it? He is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. And when you look at that baby in the manger, that's what you should see. Not cuteness, not, not helplessness. But the direct consequence of the Son of God calling you his kin and taking flesh to see it through. It is the most extraordinary restatement of God's love, God's care for us, isn't it? He didn't give up on humanity. He didn't just commit to putting one human being back on the throne. We who had lost the crown, we who were slaves, he was so mindful of us. He so cared for us that he came to give us the crown. And that's what we should see at the manger. Not just a baby, and not just a helpless infant, meek and mild. And not even just a miracle in the abstract, as though God just wanted to show that the incarnation was also in his box of tricks. You know, he wanted to make a cameo appearance in the play that he had written. If we're bored, we need to look again and see the extraordinary extent of the grace of God, who still wants us to wear the crown. 
and such grace that Jesus came not just to save us, but to make us his family. He looked at me, he looked at you, and said, my brother, my sister. At Christmas, Jesus came to give his brothers and sisters, well, to, to claim them and to give them the crown. But if you want to see the full scale of this, you need to finish the thought. And thirdly, this morning, at Christmas, Jesus came to take hold of us and to set us free. And the point is that it's about more than solidarity. I mean, there is solidarity here. He shared in flesh and blood. But this is about more than solidarity. It is about rescue. Uh, Verse 14, since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Um, I've been saying the whole way through this sermon that the key to understanding Christmas is context. If you want to understand the manger, you need to see where Jesus began, exalted above the stars. You need to see where the story ends, crowned in glory and honor. Uh, But you also need to see how low he stooped uh, to a world enslaved. And the slavery that the writer to the Hebrews is talking about is a Genesis chapter 3 slavery. Look at verse 14 again. So that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. It is the Genesis 3 world, the world that we know. We've lost our crown not because we were careless, but because we have been deceived by the devil into rebelling against God. A world where we fear death, not because we're psychologically weak, but because death is surely coming. A world where death is surely coming, not as a natural process, but as God's judgment on his treasonous creatures. And so we live in fear and slavery and always under the shadow of death because we live in a world where we are not at one with our maker. Yesterday, I spent my afternoon at Leeds Castle down in Kent, um, strangely. Um, And uh, as we were there, we enjoyed the maze um, and we enjoyed the ducks and the birds of prey. I hasten to say the ducks and the birds of prey were not in the same space. Um, And then we also enjoyed a foray into Narnia um, as they decorated the castle and made it into this magical world uh, where you could enter through a wardrobe and behind some fur coats um, and discover um, the land of Narnia. And if you've had your mind transported to Narnia before by the books um, or by the films, you'll know that C.S. Lewis captures this kind of sense of a world enslaved so well, doesn't he? Um, A world where it's marked by fear, where everything turns to stone, where it's full of lies and suspicion and treachery, under the rule of a tyrannical alien enemy, a frozen world where it is always winter and never Christmas. But if that makes our world hostile territory, a slave state ruled by the devil and deception and death, Christmas is the beginning of the liberation. I look at verse 14 again. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all of those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. And on the one hand, that verse is another reminder, isn't it? That Christmas belongs in a context, a miracle that it is. The incarnation doesn't achieve anything without Jesus' death. You need the end of the story. As David Jackman's carol puts it, he was born on earth to die. In a world where people are enslaved by sin and where the penalty for sin is death, the only way to break the captives free is to pay that price. But if it takes Jesus' death and resurrection to complete this rescue, the catch is made at Christmas. And so imagine, if you will, the human race in free fall, uh, tumbling into the void, tumbling into darkness. And then imagine a great and a mighty hand reaching out from heaven 
that then catches hold of us in mid-fall. Verse 16, surely it is not angels that he helps, or more literally, surely it is not angels that he takes hold of. It is not angels that he takes by the hand. Surely it is the offspring of Abraham that he takes hold of. He takes hold of us and he sets us free. Uh, Many of us will have been studying the book of Exodus in our small groups this year and many more of us studied it last year. And at the beginning of the book of Exodus, there's another nativity scene, isn't there? And decades before um, he would come to his people and face down the enemy and set them free, a baby was born. Um, As Moses lay in that basket, um, hidden amongst the reeds, no one would have known that all the power of Egypt would one day come crashing down around him. Well, the author of this letter to the Hebrews wants us to see that Christmas is the same, but on a bigger scale. If you're not in the habit of seeing it straight, you might think that you're just looking at a baby photo. If you're sentimental, you might strain your eyes trying to catch a glimpse of wonder. But what you should see is the deliverer who will grow up to bring down, not Pharaoh, but this whole old age, frozen in death and despair, enslaved under sin and fear, the one who would grow up to bring it all crashing down to the ground and stretching out a hand and taking hold of you to take you home. Jesus, Christmas is when Jesus took hold of us to set us free. Now, I think if you see it like this, I hope if you see it like this, then whatever Christmas is, um, it's not boring. It might be fantastic. It might be frightening. It's not boring. And that really matters. Because the problem with getting bored, whether bored of Christmas or bored of the Christian gospel more generally, is that it carries no weight. And we need weight, don't we? I'm not the extra weight that comes from eating too many mince pies. The solid weight of glory. The sense that the gospel is heavy, that it is significant, that it has some gravitational pull, that it actually matters, that it's a big thing, a big thing in our lives and a big thing in this world. I remember years ago talking to a student who would begin the week coming to meet at church here on a Sunday and would then spend most of the rest of the week in bed with a a woman who was not his wife. And there's lots that you might want to say about that. But I think one thing you could say is that whatever it was that he took from his time here on a Sunday, it had no weight. It wasn't heavy enough, big enough meaty enough to outweigh temptation when it came. But the author of this letter to the Hebrews knew that, and he was writing to Christians who thought that they knew it all. They thought they'd heard it all before. And he knows that as long as the gospel is on the list of things to which we say, yeah, yeah, I know, but we will never find it weighty enough to protect us from the fear of persecution or from the temptation to immorality, or just from getting tired. Look, it's, it's Christmas Eve, and it's time to think about Christmas and to see it straight. The Christian gospel is not lightweight, and Christmas is not boring. It marks the moment when the Son of God stoops to wear our fallen crown. It marks the moment when he came to claim his brothers and his sisters. The moment when he took us by the hand to set us free. It marks the moment when the great, the great salvation began in earnest. And God's purpose for us and my prayer for us is that this Christmas we would feel the weight of that strongly enough to keep us close to our loving caring, saving Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for your unspeakable grace and that in your great mercy, when you saw our plight, the mess that we had made, 
and you stooped. And we praise you so much for the Lord Jesus, who was made for a little while lower than the angels, so that he and we would be crowned with glory and honor, rescued from the domain of sin and death, set free. We praise you that he called us, he calls us his brothers and his sisters. And we pray that you'd help us to see just how weighty that is. And we ask that you'd keep us close to him. In Jesus' name, amen.